When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of birth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when love of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. When the roll
God face to face and we will sing these words.
so glad you're here today. We uh, want you to turn to the person beside you or somebody around you, and I want you to say, hello, neighbor. Hello, neighbor. I remember growing up watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Did anybody else watch it? Has anybody seen Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Uh, most of you. Most of you have seen it. You know about it, right? You're familiar with Fred Rogers. This is a brilliant television show. It still comes on TV. You can watch it on PBS. That's how I grew up watching it. There's a movie out now that came out a few years ago that Tom Hanks stars in, and he is Mr. Fred Rogers. It's called Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Really neat movie. Encourage you to watch it. It's great. Focuses on the personality of Fred Rogers and who he is. And, and this show is, is, is very entertaining. It's educational. If you've ever watched it or your kids have watched it. it. It's inspiring. It inspires you to be a better person. That's who Fred is. Matter of fact, Fred Rogers in real life was an ordained pastor. Did you know that? He was a pastor. You can see that, right? If you, if you watch the show, you'd be like, that guy's kind of got a pastor's heart. He's, a, he's a, a gentle, loving man just like our pastor. Ronald, that was a big grunt, brother. But this show is also a little bit strange. Maybe even a little creepy at times. The show offers everything. And when the show opens, it opens with a song that goes like this. And I'm going to read you these lyrics. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in the beauty wood. That's weird words, right? We don't say beauty wood much. It's a neighborly day in the beauty wood. It's a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? And then it says, I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be? Yes! I'm so proud of you. You know this song. This is how it starts out. Fred Rogers comes walking through the door. He's got his coat on. He takes his coat off, hangs it up, gets his little sweater cardigan out. I should have worn one today. He puts his little cardigan on, and then he sits on the bench, and he's singing this song so gently. It just so smooth off his lips, right? It's like, oh, this is great. Mr. Rogers, I love you. He takes his shoes off, puts on his sneakers. And then he says, hello, neighbor. And you just feel like you're just one of him. Like, like you're there. Like you, He really wants you to be his neighbor. And as the show goes on, Mr. Rogers, he encounters many friends and neighbors in the show. Some of them human and some of them make-believe. And that's where it kind of gets a little weird, right? Let's meet a few of his neighbors. Here's the first one. The old trolley. Y'all know trolley. He talks to the trolley, and trolley talks back. Not in voice, but in like the bell, the bell chiming. It's weird. Look at the next one. Anybody know who that is? Mr. McFeely. Speedy delivery. That's what he says. He comes walking in, rings the doorbell, speedy delivery. He's all upbeat and excited. Let's look at what's next. This is the neighborhood. There's an actual neighborhood that is created that they show in, this, in, the, in the show every day. And the trolley is a part of that neighborhood. And then we can't forget these characters. The creepy puppets. I mean, look at these. Who, not who, what is that? We got a king and a queen and 
and it. And then a tiger. Do y'all know who this, this is Daniel. This is Daniel Tiger. And for all of our kids that would be in here, could be in here, all of our kids would know who Daniel Tiger is. It's a new spinoff show on PBS. I know it well. My kids have watched it, and it's called Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. And it's spun off, and it's not near as creepy. Daniel looks a lot better than he does in puppet form right here. As we see in this opening song, and we see in the variety of characters that we just showed on the screen, Mr. Rogers was willing to be neighborly with anyone and everyone. Fred Rogers did not exclude anybody from his neighborhood. I, I just said when I would watch the show and the opening of the show, I felt like I was one of his neighbors. When he would look at and say, hello neighbor, I felt like he was talking to me like, I'm your neighbor. I felt so welcomed. I felt so included. And despite their size, their social class, their color, their gender, or whether they were real or make-believe, Fred Rogers wanted these people to be a part of his neighborhood. He wanted them to be his neighbor. Won't you be my neighbor? And that is the title of our new sermon series. Today we're going to begin by identifying our neighbors. If you've been paying attention this year, 2021, you will have noticed, and I hope you've been paying attention, you will have noticed this is about the third time in seven months, eight months now, it's August, this is about the third time in eight months that I've really put a big focus on neighbors. I've put a big focus on evangelism. I've put a big focus on reaching others. That's kind of been our theme for this year. And I've, I, I may bring it back up again before the year's over with. We spent a lot of time. Back in May, we did it in January, and then we did it again in May. In May, we talked about being neighborly, and, and I preached a sermon called Empty Jars. Remember that? Everybody got a jar when you came in. And I talked about going out and finding empty jars. Jessica's holding one up in the sound booth back there. And, and, and during that time, we, we, we met two new neighbors. Junior started coming. God saved his soul. We baptized him. He's changed his life. I got connected to Billy, an empty jar, a neighbor. I've met two new neighbors in the last few weeks. And that theme is going to continue right here. We're going to jump right back in it and focus in on it in these next few weeks. Who are our neighbors? Who are our neighbors? Let's look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, for the answer here. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This expert, this religious expert looks at Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? So Jesus in his famous way, I've talked about this many times. Jesus, in his famous way, answers a question with a question. Don't you love people like that? I like to do that with my kids. They ask me a question, and I'm like, I'll put it back on them. Because I know they know the answer. Like, you're asking me a question, Charlie, that I know you know the answer to. Why are you asking me that? That's annoying. So I'm going to get you back, and I'm going to put it back on you. That's what Jesus does here. He's like, you know the answer, and certainly he did. This religious teacher, Christ knew that he was smart enough. He answered and said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. We know this scripture so well. And love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will Live. Problem solved, right? 
The guy asked a question. He answered his own question. Jesus affirmed his answer and said, you are correct, 100 on this test. And then listen what the man says to Jesus. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I've preached this text before. Matter of fact, the last time I preached this, I looked back, was three years ago. 2018 is the last time I preached this message. Did a whole series and we focused on this text. And it's going to be similar to that today, but I want to refresh your memory here and talk about it. This guy has just answered his, his own question. He asked a question he knew the answer to. And, G, and Jesus says to him, love God, love your neighbor. And you know what? He, he doesn't even question the part about loving God. He's good with that. He's like, love God? I can do that part. I got no problem with that, Jesus. I can love God. He's, he's my dude. He's my guy. Got that covered. Check. But then to justify himself, he, he looks at Jesus and says, now, hold on a minute. Who is my neighbor, Jesus? Because if you're telling me, I can love, I can love our God, but if you're telling me I've got to love the neighbors that you love, because, see, Jesus, you love tax collectors. Nobody likes tax collectors. You see, Jesus, I've watched you and, and you had this love for prostitutes. Not in a weird way. You had this love for prostitutes and nobody loves prostitutes. You, you, you see, Jesus, you, you, you love the scum of, the, of, of, of society. Surely you're not suggesting that they are my neighbors. Surely you're not telling me I should love thieves because you said, you, you showed us that you love thieves. Jesus, you go to the least of these. You go to the ones that nobody wants to love. Who's my neighbor? Those are not my neighbors. Jesus responds to this religious leader. Because the, the religious expert just wouldn't give up. He wouldn't give up. He asked a question. He comes to an answer. He asks another question to keep the conversation going. And Jesus decides to tell him a story. Jesus says, I'm going to tell you a story. And it's one of the most famous stories in Scripture. There's a lot of popular stories that we know of. But the story of the Good Samaritan is one of the most popular in Scripture. Matter of fact, it's so popular that the Good Samaritan story is told outside of religious context probably more than any other story. You just look around you. How many times have you, have you heard of a, the Good Samaritan or, or Samaritan's Purse? We just talked about this. You hear that word a lot. It's thrown around a lot. Because it's about doing good deeds, right? So Jesus looks at this religious leader and says, I'm going to tell you this story. And in this story, this man is walking from Jerusalem. He's a, Jew, he's a Jewish man. He's a Jew. He's walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he's walking through one of the most dangerous areas in the land. Have you ever been in a, a city? You ever been in a city and you found yourself in a sketchy part of town? Whether you're walking or driving, we were in Cincinnati a few weeks ago. You know, them travels I told y'all about. We went to Cincinnati for, for a, a day and went and watched the Braves play in Cincinnati. Sorry, Randy, I should have taken you with me. And, and we, we, our hotel was right across the river. Oh, Cincinnati's beautiful. I've been several times. Our hotel was right across the river from the stadium. And I told, I told Mitzi and the kids, I said, we can just walk. There's no need parking. We can park at the hotel, walk across the river. It's a walking bridge. There were people around. Well, to get to the walking bridge, it was about three blocks down our road. It was sketch. Sketchy. It was dark, not well lit. Trash on the ground. A couple of homeless people. 
And Mitzi looked at me and was like, are, are we okay? It's like, yeah, just walk fast. Walk fast, don't look back. And it was fine. It was okay. But, but for a moment, you know, we, we're walking under a bridge. We're walking under an overpass and there's graffiti everywhere. And it's like, this is where people die. This is where bad things happen, and that's the kind of road that this man was walking on. And it was known in the area that you would be robbed if you took this path. And indeed, this man was robbed. This man is walking along, and these robbers come out, and the Bible says they take him up, everything from him. Everything this man had, they took from him. They beat him half to death and stripped all of his clothes off and left him naked to die. Read the story. I'm not going to read it today out of the text, but I'm going to tell you about it. They left him half dead, the Bible says. Just picture this man on this path, this dirt path, a rugged area, and he's left there naked with nothing, hopeless, barely living. But it's okay. Y'all don't worry about that man because the preacher's coming. The preacher's on his way and it's his job and he'll take care of him. And the priest shows up in the story and the priest walks right by him. I would never do that, by the way. The preacher walks right by him. The priest goes right by him. Why? Because the priest thought he was dead. And if he's dead, he's unclean. And if the, if the priest touches the unclean thing, then he's got to go back to Jerusalem and he's got to make a sacrifice and go to the temple and all this, all this other stuff, go through this process to get himself clean again. So he don't have time for that. I got somewhere to be. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Ain't got time or the money for that today. Too big of a sacrifice. Then comes along a Levite. Levi, wa Levite walks up. Surely the Levite man will stop and check on him. Nope. The Bible says he passes them by on the other side. We don't know a lot about this part of the story. We don't know why the Levite didn't stop, but we can draw our own conclusions, right? Number one, he probably didn't stop because he didn't want to be caught with the man. He might be held responsible for his condition. Number two, it, how dangerous would it have been for him to stop and check on this man? What if the robbers were waiting in the hills for someone to stop and check on him so then they could come out, beat him, strip him, and take all of his stuff? And perhaps he thought the man was already dead as well. I mean, the Bible says he was half dead. Who knows what his condition is? If you walk up on somebody like that, you're probably going to be a little hesitant to get too close. right? I mean, you just would. And then Jesus introduces one of the most hated people in, in the land. Jesus, here's what Jesus, what it says. A Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. The very existence of Samaritans during this time was evil. They were scums. Nobody like them. They were traitors to the Jewish people. They were despised. They were outcast. They had no access to the temple or to worship. They had no access to go make their own sacrifices. They had no access to God because, come on, they're mutts. They were half breeds. That's the reality. And a Samaritan. This half-breed comes along, the worst enemy of the Jewish people, and he walks upon this Jewish man who's half-dead. And this average guy takes center stage in this story that Jesus is sharing, and it's absolutely remarkable. He came to this man, and he bandaged up his wounds. He, he took his, his oil, and he, 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 he took everything that he had that he could he could. Help take care of this man. He had wine and oil because they would travel with this to help prepare their meals. And, and, and using it like peroxide and an antiseptic, he takes this oil and he takes this, he, he, he takes this oil and I got to note some oil right here. 
I just need Danny to come up here and uh, help me out. So I pour it on his head. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Danny. He takes this oil and he takes this wine and he pours it on this man's wounds. This man that's half dead. And he, 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 he cleans his wounds. And then he takes, these, he takes these bandages. He's got these bandages on him. Or maybe, maybe he didn't. Maybe he had to rip his own clothes to, to find a bandage. I mean, y'all don't walk around with band-aids normally, do you? You do? Okay, Danny. Really? That's why you didn't play the part of the man. But he, he, he takes these bandages, the Bible says, and he bandages them up. Pours that oil on him and takes care of him. But that's not all. Then he takes his own donkey. His own transportation. And he's like, you know what? I don't even need this transportation. This man's half dead. He picks the man up. The story doesn't say that, but he had to get on the donkey somehow. He picks the man up and puts him on his donkey. And travels with him into town. Goes to a hotel. Hyatt Regency. Hilton. I don't know. It was an inn. He goes to an inn. And he checks in. And he takes the man to a room and cleans him up. And feeds him and gives him drink. And takes care of him and stays with him through the night. I've never done that for anybody. Never. And I'm going to be honest with you for a moment, folks. I think I'm a neighborly guy. But in this situation, if I do help the man, I'm probably going to look at him and be like, hey, man, here's $50. I hope everything turns out all right. Because sometimes it's just easier just to handle money and go on your way, right? Because I got some, my son's got a baseball game tonight. I do not have time to take you and check you into a room. I don't have time to get you to a hospital or get you to a doctor because I, I've got somewhere to be tonight. Uh, the Braves play in an hour, buddy. I'm just being real. We're going to talk about this next week. We're talking about time management next week. So come back, part two. I'm being real though, right? I've had somebody tell me before since I've been at Gordon Lake. And that person's not here today, so I'm going to say it. But I had somebody come to me one day, and I went to lunch with this person. Was a part of our church. And this person looked at me and said, Pastor, I want to be involved in what's going on at Gordon Lake. I said, okay. We want you involved. God wants you involved. He wants you to serve. He wants you to be a part of what we're doing here. And this person looked at me and said, oh, no, I don't have any time, but I do have money. That was said to me. And I appreciate that. I, I appreciate you giving, tithe, and offering. I say it every week. It means so much. It's biblical. But it's just as important to give time, right? And I wanted to look at this guy, and I didn't. I wanted to look at this person and say, hey, you're not telling me that. You're telling God that. This person just looked and told God, I'm not God, but I represent the church of the living God. And, and I wanted to be like, dude, you're not telling me you don't have time. You're telling God that you don't have time. You're serving him, not me in the church. And a lot of times, our time and our willingness to serve comes with sacrifice. Okay, I'm going to be preaching next week's sermon. i got to quit. So this man takes care of this Samaritan. Or this Samaritan takes care of this man. Stays with him all night in the inn. And then he goes downstairs, or he goes to the front desk, wherever he was at. And he looks at the innkeeper and says, hey, I'm covering all the expenses. So he didn't just give of his money. He gave of, he sacrificed his time and his energy and his efforts. I, I just, I put myself in this story. And I stop and think to myself, Danny, what if I called my wife one evening? And I said, hey, I'm not going to be coming home. I'm staying with a guy at a hotel until he gets better. 
Well, who is he? Oh, I don't know who he is. I met him along the road. He was hurt, needed help. I had an opportunity to help him, so I'm going to help him. I'll see you in the morning. I'm going to stay with a stranger in a room and make sure he's okay before I leave him. I know this was different times, but was it? Are we too good to be really, really neighborly? As Pastor Philip comes this morning, this guy looked at the innkeeper and he says, I'm not just going to pay for the expenses that have been incurred. I want to pay for any other expenses that this man may have after I leave. So if there's anything else I owe, if he decides he wants to order room service, or an in-room video, a movie, I'll pay for it. You see, this Samaritan man realized something. As he's walking down the road, this Samaritan looks down and sees a man beaten, naked. Stripped of everything, hopeless, searching for compassion. I'm about to preach to you now, get ready. This man is searching for someone to have compassion and mercy on him. And this, this man, this Samaritan's walking down the road, and he says, This guy needs a neighbor. He just needs a neighbor. He just needs someone to love on him, to welcome him, to wrap his arm, their arms around him, to take care of him, to make him feel included. Just like Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers made everybody feel included. Hello, neighbor. I just imagine this Samaritan man walking up to this man who's broken and beaten and battered and overlooked. And saying, hello, neighbor. I'm here for you today. You see the cor- correlation here? You see the connection to the gospel message? A guy beaten down with nothing to do to help himself, stripped and naked, nothing to offer and nobody to save him, and a man comes along. Boy, that'll preach, Randy. A man comes along who can offer hope and compassion and love and grace and mercy and he came in the form of of a man that nobody expected and he, he showed love and compassion and he was neighborly and he bandaged the person up and he sacrificed his own efforts his time, his money, everything he had he made his own sacrifices on behalf of somebody who was an enemy As you stand this morning, I hope you see where I've gone here. We're going to land the plane. There are people in your family. We're going to start close to home. There are people in your family right now, brothers, sisters, children, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandmas, grandpas, grandchildren. There's people in your family right now that are hopeless they're hopeless you, you're picturing them I, I got them in my, in my home well, not my home but in my family I've got them in my family i got people in my family I'm connected to who are hopeless and they feel like nobody cares we've not checked on them we've not asked them how they're doing we've not stopped by you, you get what I'm saying And we're the church. The priest walked by the man and left him. I have, I, I'm not even going to get to the enemy part. Because they're your neighbors too. But let's just start with the family. Let's start with the people you love. Have you checked in on them? Are they in a hopeless situation and have you offered them an 
an option for care and compassion and love? Spiritually, have you offered them Jesus? You know why Billy Jackson is saved and on his way to glory today? Because his family offered him Jesus. His own daughter-in-law called me up and said, he wants to talk to you about Jesus. That's why. Who's your neighbor? Everybody and anybody. From your family to your worst enemy and the, the most distant stranger in your life. And they need hope. They need a neighbor. Can we be neighborly? Can we ask someone, won't you be my neighbor? Please, oh please, won't you be my neighbor? And show them love and compassion. Show them mercy. Do something practical and tangible in their lives that can help them. Even if it means sacrificing your own time. You want to show somebody how much they mean to you? You find someone that's in a hard situation in their life that needs a friend, needs a loved one, and you look at them and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take a vacation day today, and I'm going to spend time with you, just me and you. How many, of us want a va- how many of us want to spare a vacation day just to help somebody? That'll show you that you love them. Sacrifice something. I know the easy way out. I get that. I get that. And there's, there, there's, sometimes that's okay. Some of you will hand me money this month and say, here, I don't want to go shopping for Chris, Operation Christmas Child, but here's $100 to go buy some stuff. That's okay. We'll take it. We're not going to turn, turn your money away. So, Randy, you can give me that $100. But there's something really fulfilling, right, when we go and sacrifice our own time and effort and do our part. Man, there's something fulfilling about it. Give it a try. This week, be neighborly. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Would you bow with me? Lord, thank you for today. Thank you, dear God, that you sent your son as a sacrifice for us, showing the most neighborly effort known to humanity. Thank you for this beautiful story that's been shared that your son Jesus shared with the religious leader that day and that we have today. It was such a popular and powerful story. God, I ask your God that you would take this message and drive it into our hearts today and our minds. Don't, don't, don't let it just be, oh, we heard a good sermon today. Don't let it just be one that, that, that flies in one ear and out the other. Let it, let it bring about practical application in our lives. Let us look and search and, 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 and try to find those people that we pass by sometimes. Don't let us be passerbys to those who are looking and searching for someone who to be neighborly. Give us those opportunities, I pray, and help us to be aware of those moments. Help us to seize and capitalize on those opportunities to be neighborly. God, I pray, God, for each and every one that's here today. I pray for the homes, the families, loved ones, friends, situations that might be going on in people's lives, dear God. Those who are traveling, I pray for mercies as they, as they travel home. Whatever it is we are facing today, God, whatever it is we have in our heart, God, I, you know it. You know it, God. And as I shared this week with our church family on Facebook, you don't reject our prayers. You've not rejected our prayers. You hear our prayers and you love us and we thank you for that. We give you worship and adoration for that. Minister in and through our lives, I pray, dear God. Help us to be your hands and feet this week. Light in the darkness. Keep us safe and watch over us. God, be with our, our communities. I just want to pause and say, God, be with our communities and our world and our, uh, our, our area, God. 
as we, as we continue to battle this, this pandemic and this COVID situation. Lord, we put all our trust in you. God, give us wisdom and understanding as a people. Help us to be safe and watch over us, God. We love you today. Help us to love you and to love others in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen.